You are listening to Everyday Evidence, presented by the American Occupational Therapy Association, helping the occupational therapy practitioner apply evidence to practice. Here's your host, Matt Brandenburg. Okay, today we are joined by Dr. Susan Cahill and Dr. Stephanie Beisbeer to discuss the Children and Youth Practice Guidelines for ages 5 to 21 and clinical applications for occupational therapy practitioners. Susan Cahill is the Director of Evidence-Based Practice at the American Occupational Therapy Association. Stephanie Beisbeer is an Associate Professor in the Occupational Therapy Department at Mount Mary University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Welcome to the show. Thank Thanks, you. Matt. You're very welcome. Can you talk to us about your backgrounds in working with children and youth between ages 5 and 21 and what your motivations were to be a part of developing practice guidelines to serve this population? Sure. This is Stephanie. I can go first if that's okay. I have been an occupational therapist for uh, right around 30 years and mainly working with pediatric clients the bulk of that time. I spent a lot of time in school-based practice. I've also done some, a little bit of birth to three, but community practice and, and worked in an outpatient clinic and summer adolescent program for teens for a number of years. And even though I'm now an educator, I still do have a role in school practice, and I'm really grateful to have that opportunity to to keep myself in in practice in a real way. In regard to my motivation, I would say it stems from my desire for practitioners to really feel more confident in their ability to use evidence in their everyday decision making. So knowing that the practice guidelines are really intended to be user-friendly and that type of a source of information and that having such a resource can be so empowering to practitioners. I know that um, finding evidence, appraising evidence, and figuring out how to apply it is is something OTs do on a regular basis, but I know that I often found it a bit daunting and time-consuming. So the practice guidelines just seemed like a a great go-to or a starting point for others and made me want to be involved. I love that. And how about you, Susan? Yeah, so I've been an occupational therapist for uh, about 24, 25 years, um, and the majority of my clinical experience had been in public schools. Um, I worked with um, general education teams and students, and then also in more restrictive environments. For example, um, publicly funded special ed schools. Um, Back in the day, they were called um, self-contained schools. And I also worked in private therapeutic day schools. And I started teaching. And and after I started teaching, I did continue to do some consultation with both public schools um, as well as uh, those private schools. I also have experience working as a special education administrator. uh, So for one of those self-contained buildings, and then also for um, different general education buildings where I supervised teams that included teachers and related service providers, as well as paraprofessionals. And I also did some moonlighting um, and early intervention and private outpatient practice. So sort of a breadth of experience related to pediatrics. Uh, I kept coming back to schools, though, because I really felt like it was exciting to see kids for a really long period of time um, and sometimes over the course of different years to really see sort of how their, their performance and participation changed. And I got interested in, in participating in this project, um, much like Stephanie. You know, I'm really interested in helping to support practitioners to engage in more evidence-based work. Um, I think something else that drew me to this was also uh, trying to support pediatric occupational therapy practitioners in particular in adapting and using occupation and activity more. I think there's such a tendency in pediatric practice to, to focus purely on developmental aspects of pediatric care. And, and while that is very important, I think that we play such a large role in helping to make sure that students are able to, or children rather, are able to participate um, and really engage in those everyday activities that we sometimes take for granted. So activities of daily living, all those IADLs, issues related to health management. And, and that was really sort of what drove me to want to participate. Absolutely. Well, I think it is safe to say that we have two experts on the show today, and I, for one, am very excited to to learn from both of you. I have to be honest, though, the, the first thing that strikes me when I hear the practice guidelines for ages 5 to 21 is that that age range between 5 years old and 21 years old is pretty big, and the occupations of 5-year-olds are very different from the occupations of 21-year-olds, 1-year-olds. 
So why is this the age range included in these practice guidelines? Yes, we, we certainly recognize that that age span is large. However, it really represents school age children and youth. So we believe that that's the main reason because literature is oftentimes around those particular time frames with children. So the one practice guideline is for children under age five, and then the second practice guideline is this larger um, time span. And while it may not be ideal, the range is also what's been used in the past. And so the whenever there's an update, such as this one, we're really comparing apples to apples. So it's built on that previous scope. All right. Thank you for that explanation. Susan, anything to add there? You know, I would just say that um, like from a really practical standpoint, it's really important when we're working with children to have a sense of their trajectory and also the expectations that they will face in the next five or even 10 years. And so that that large body of literature, I think, helps us to sort of remember and attend to this idea that um, when we're working in pediatrics, we're not just addressing sort of the child as they are in front of us today, but they're really we're really focusing on, um, you know, those big outcomes for children in the future. No, I was just going to say that's a good point. And, and also when when people are reading the practice guidelines and if they want to dig a little bit deeper into the systematic reviews, as we describe the particular studies, we would talk about the age ranges of those who are involved in each particular study. So that helps the practitioner also to identify um, not only what the child and what interventions are, are relevant at that point in time, but as Susan mentioned, then the trajectory forward. Absolutely. I love that perspective of considering the trajectory and different age groupings um, that are available in the research right now. And that leads perfectly into my next question for you, uh, which is if you have any tips or tricks on, on how practitioners who work with a large age range of children and youth could focus their efforts to search for evidence that supports their best practice. Yeah, well, I think, you know, one of the first places that they can go is to really uh, look up that practice guideline that's published in AGEN on this topic. Uh, OT practitioners, our reach and services to children and youth is really growing, and we're really moving beyond providing intervention to children with known medical conditions and developmental concerns. And the practice guidelines for children and youth uh, 5 to 21 really include relevant information for children and youth, both with and without known disabilities. And they're really focused on, I think, um, one of the cornerstones of, of OT, uh, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, which is really that knowledge and expertise in the therapeutic use of occupation and helping to promote kids' participation in everyday activities. So I think um, the practice guideline is a great uh, one-stop shop um, if people wanted to start using and incorporating evidence in their practice and staying up to date. Perfect. Well, I, I love that that's the, the one-stop shop and the, the best place to start as it will be the focus for the remainder of this interview. Well, on, on our show, we've talked about practice guidelines in the past. And by now, hopefully, we all know that systematic reviews are a big part of developing practice guidelines. I know there were three focused questions addressed by the systematic reviews outlined in these specific practice guidelines. The first being, what is the evidence for the effectiveness of activity and occupation-based interventions within the scope of occupational therapy practice to improve ADLs, IADLs, play and leisure, and rest and sleep? The second question was, what is the evidence for the effectiveness of activity and occupation-based interventions within the scope of OT to improve mental health, positive behavior, and social participation? And third, was about the effectiveness of activity and occupation-based interventions to improve learning, academic achievement, and successful participation in school. And I believe you two worked on different questions in this review. Could you kind of give us an overview of what you were found in researching those questions? Sure. I can go first. I This is Stephanie, and I worked on the ADL, IADL, play, leisure, rest, and sleep question. And I would agree it was a scoping question. It was a large question and I could probably talk about it for a long time, but I want to, you know, really kind of target in because when we look across all these occupations, we did really find some important aspects of the activity and occupation-based interventions that we can say with confidence have an impact on the overall effectiveness of interventions. So, for example, 
amongst all of those. So I'm not just talking about ADL or play and leisure. I'm really looking at the whole scope. We found that embedding strategies into children's current routines and environments is really a key consideration. And then, in addition, if we're using things like functional skills-centered training versus a focus on performance skills or isolated client factors, which is something that Susan kind of was mentioning earlier when she talked about focus just on development or just on some of those individual client factors. So we really want to look at um, the functional skills training as opposed to that. Another example is the use of structured and guided play participation strategies. We know that play is a main occupation of children, right? And so we, we, as occupational therapists, can focus on play as a goal, as an end outcome, but then also use play participation strategies as a means to really support those overall, um, those overall abilities to perform, to participate, and to be satisfied with their, with their play. So that's pretty exciting. Um, For instance, we might have a child with issues with motor control that impacts their participation in play experiences, and the findings under this systematic review would guide us to use things like coaching and modeling and that guided play participation, so guided by the therapist, guided by the caregiver, and maybe even somewhat guided by peers within that child's everyday environment. And then, of course, another thing that we took away is that we want to use their preferred activities and their own and preferred materials. So those are a couple of things. So in in that sense, the focus is less on the specific motor or isolated coordination issue and more on the level of participation that can be achieved by embedding training and feedback and follow-up. And the findings also really strongly supported collaborative efforts with caregivers. This was really evident across all the areas of occupation in this review, and it was a powerful aspect of maximizing the intervention effectiveness. So those, I would say, would be some of the more global findings. Uh, Thank you for highlighting those. I think our listeners will be able to glean kind of what some of the the most backed interventions are by the evidence um, and hopefully run with that and incorporating it to, to their daily practice. We'll get back to our interview right after this quick message. You all know we really try to make research more consumable and applicable on everyday evidence. But did you know that just one minute of your time could help us to improve the show, improve the resources the American Occupational Therapy Association provides for practitioners, and improve the application of evidence to practice within our whole field? Please take our one-minute survey. It's only three questions, and you can find the link in this and every episode's description and support the AOTA in continued efforts to improve our podcasts and to improve the translation of research to practice. Now back to the interview. And Susan, I want to ask you the same question. Uh, Could you give us an overview of what was found in in the question you were researching um, and maybe share with us some of the most effective um, activity and occupation-based interventions for, for your question? Sure. So I focused on the question related to mental health positive behavior, and social participation. So those were the outcomes that we were looking at and really focused on using, again, activity and occupation-based interventions to achieve those outcomes. And I worked on that question with two of my colleagues, um, Brad Egan and Joanna Sieber. And we, again, really wanted to highlight the unique contributions that OTs can make in this area of child mental health. And our question was really worded in such a way that activity and occupation was was the focus in terms of those interventions. And this was really important to us because there's a lot of turf in the child and youth mental health arena. Um, Other providers and professionals and even families wanna know why OT practitioners are are involved or why are they getting involved? And really what are we doing that's different than a counselor or a school social worker? And so we see a lot of overlap between services provided by all of these different professionals and sometimes a little redundancy. And so what we really hope to do with this question was to help to draw some parameters around our interventions to show that the use of activity and occupation are our unique domain and that they're effective in supporting uh, kids' mental health, social participation, and behavior. Um, And so again, the question that we worked on addressed all three of those outcomes Um, And as Stephanie said, you know, she already mentioned play, but it's no surprise that play was found to have um, strong evidence for supporting social participation. 
We looked at play interventions and found a lot of success with interventions that included peers, parent involvement, and also really capitalizing on the child's intrinsic motivation. And so, you know, we were really excited by that finding because it really highlights our client-centered approach. Um, we also found that interventions like sports activities, for example, specifically karate and other martial arts were associated with strong evidence for all three outcomes, mental health, behavior, and social participation. And so besides the health benefits of physical activity related to these um, types of different martial arts activities, this finding was really interesting to, to me because we're thinking about kids who may be less inclined maybe for team sports, but a way for them to still get in, engaged in this way. And also thinking about how important a role we play in helping children to identify and cultivate interests outside of what they might be familiar with. Video and computer games provided a strong evidence for social participation. Um, and we thought that that was important because those virtual contexts uh, potentially provide a less risky context for kids to practice social skills than maybe more traditional land-based contexts like the school playground, for example, or the school cafeteria. We also found um, strong strength of evidence for yoga and programs that taught uh, breathing and relaxation techniques, visualization, and these were found to significantly improve mood and anxiety. And what we really liked about those interventions was going back to what Stephanie said, they could be easily incorporated into a child's typical daily routine. Um, something that strategies that they could use on an ongoing basis. Awesome. Thank you so much. One one thing I really find interesting in conducting these interviews and learning more about practice guidelines and research that's already been conducted within uh, the field of occupational therapy, I, I'm noticing that promoting physical activity and incorporating physical activity as a, as a treatment and an intervention is almost always supported by evidence in, in leading to positive outcomes. So that's that's very interesting to me. And physical activity in the context of their everyday life and routine and those and physical activity in the context of their valued occupations is really what comes across in the literature is important as well. So when we think about physical activity in regard to just rote exercise, we know that the findings are not as supportive of strong outcomes. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that clarification. And I know, Susan, you mentioned that that this publication was, was in the American Journal of Occupational Therapy, and it includes a clinical recommendations table full of, of additional interventions for children and youth ages 5 to 21. I think I could ask you guys questions about specific interventions and, and how effective they are and how to incorporate them into practice all day long. Um, but for time's sake, could you, you maybe highlight one or two interventions from this table that practitioners should really strive to include in their practice if appropriate for their clients and maybe talk about how they could be incorporated into treatment? Sure. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up that clinical recommendations table. I think that's something if people aren't familiar with, that it's really worth checking out. Um, so the recommendations included in that table were graded um, and then based on the, the system used by the U.S. Preventative Task Force. And so we're really hoping that practitioners, when they look at that table, start to hone in on the recommendations that are highlighted in green or are listed by having an A or a B. So those recommendations have strong or moderate strength of evidence supporting them. And just one of the um, sort of a series of maybe uh, interventions that, I, that, that come to mind for me are those ones, again, related to yoga and thinking about um, addressing mental health concerns again, in the, the child's typical daily routine. And one of the things that somebody could do, um, especially, is get a group of students together, help them to learn a series of different postures, uh, yoga games, and relaxation and breathing techniques, and then really work with the people in their, in their environment to help the children to integrate these strategies throughout their day. Um, so it could be their school day, but also during evenings and weekends at home. Um, and to really work with the children to think about keeping a log to sort of monitor when they need to take a break or use the strategy, what happens after they take the break um, or use the strategy so that they're able to develop that, that reflective sense and also start to regulate um, their own emotional responses. And also, um, again, use those strategies independently. 
Absolutely. Thank you. That that sounds like such a great intervention in that it touches on physical activity, incorporating it into the context of, of a client's occupations, and also incorporates social participation and, and participating in, in yoga with other children and or youth as well. Um, and then takes it even a step farther with, with journaling and logging. Um, so that's really interesting. Stephanie, is there a, a specific intervention you'd like to highlight and, and give us an example on how it could be incorporated into practice? Sure. I, I can highlight an intervention within that ADL and IADL area. And actually, I think you'll notice as I speak about it, some of the similarities to what Susan already identified, even though it's a different approach. It's not yoga-based. Um, but I'm going to talk about one of the specific interventions focused on ADL or self-care outcomes. And it was the use of cognitive-based strategies for children. So using the cognitive orientation to occupational performance approach, which many of you might know as co-op, was found to be effective with the population of kiddos with um, developmental coordination disorder. And the intervention really included the use of collaborative goal setting, which Susan kind of mentioned, instruction, and then targeted feedback. And in one of the studies, that approach resulted in really significant improvement in self-care participation, but also performance. And what I would consider really important is the overall satisfaction of the child and, and the caregivers. So we also know that some additional studies that are mentioned on, on that table support the cognitive strategies and result in a strong strength of evidence. So I would say based on this, practitioners can incorporate the features of the co-op or some of those other similar cognitive-based approaches with a wide range of ADL tasks. So we could consider how we work with the child to determine goals and a starting point that the child feels invested in, and then need to provide instruction, clear feedback that incorporates some of those metacognitive means to assist the child in making good choices and, of course, appraising their successes and also maybe some of their challenges. So, for instance, a child maybe is working toward a goal of independent dressing, and with your support, they arrive at a goal of donning socks. We guide them in a plan, provide feedback on how they're actually, you know, quote unquote, doing it or engaging in the task, and then support them in their self-appraisal. And I know Susan mentioned that that is a critical element as well. So then the next step using these approaches would be to, to coach them to make the needed changes to their plan or to problem solve the strategies. And eventually that child recognizes their own contribution to the goal attainment and can continue to increase engagement and performance. So that's just an example of how to take a cognitive strategy, focus it on an ADL task, and it's okay to use an existing program like the co-op approach. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that example. I know when learning about co-op while uh, in school, it, it can sometimes be a tough concept to grasp and learning about guided discovery. It really helps to hear a, a, an example like that and a recommendation like that on how to incorporate those cognitive strategies into practice. So I and, and the listeners definitely appreciate it. I want to now highlight some of the case studies that are included in the practice guidelines. Uh, but before we move on, I just wanted to ask if there's anything either you wanted to add um, in our discussions about specific interventions. You know, I would just say that uh, with regards to the um, mental health, social participation and behavior question, there was a large a body of literature that really supported the use of group interventions. And so really thinking about, um, again, uh, having students or children work together in groups, I think has found to be um, really more effective than some of our individually based interventions, which just speaks again to the idea and provide support for um, integrating our services within classrooms and other spaces where kids work and play. Awesome. Thank you so much. Like I mentioned, there are some case studies included in, in the practice guidelines. I love a good case study because um, I feel like they really highlight how practitioners can consider evidence, clinical reasoning, uh, as well as their clients' goals and needs when implementing interventions. Um, and especially from my perspective, uh, uh, just a budding practitioner, it's really helpful to hear um, from others what they did and whether it was successful or not in, in trying to, to plan out my own interventions. So first, could you tell us about the adolescent group case Vignette, I think I'm saying that right, um, related to, to teens struggling with sleep disturbance that's included in the practice guidelines and talk about how this example really illustrates high quality OT practice. 
Sure, I, I can speak to that example. Um, this particular vignette was created to really emphasize best practice with the use of peer groups, which is something that Susan mentioned earlier as well, and also coaching practices to empower teens to make strong individual decisions and also to address sleep as a valued occupation, which is really important. Um, I think it might be most clear if I, I just read the brief intro paragraph in the vignette itself, and then I can talk a little bit about the interventions. But the way that this was designed, we just indicated that an occupational therapist is working with a small group of adolescents with musculoskeletal pain and related sleep disturbance. The teens share their challenges with the group. They discuss and document the number of hours they are able to achieve quality sleep per night and the strategies they have used in the past. And then on the basis of this information, the OT collaborates with the teens to design interventions. And then in the vignette, we've listed a number of interventions. Um, and the interventions highlighted the use of collaborative goal setting and even sharing some sample or model goals so that the teens could create achievable and measurable personal goals. So that was a really big factor in this vignette to show that we want that full participation, especially when we're talking about teenagers. We know that they have the abilities most often to really be part of the planning and part of the team. And so providing them with some model goals so that they could then um, personalize them and see where this particular interventions could take them in the end. Another element of the case study that highlights quality OT practice, I think, is the inclusion of the parents and the peers in small group sessions. So in this particular vignette, the, the small groups of participants and parents were given some face-to-face -face sessions, and then they, with education on sleep recommendations and the effects of the, uh, and principles of guided imagery, which was an additional intervention piece. And then that was followed up by therapist-led guided imagery experiences, et cetera. So by the second session, the parents and teens would then engage in these interventions in a more self-directed way and experience that while being supported by the therapist as a coach. So the focus on the parents and the peers and the small group sessions was all part of that really trying to highlight what is best practice in occupational therapy. And then we also wanted to emphasize the teams, teens in the case study that they documented their sleep quality in, in an ongoing self-assessment and progress toward their goals. So then they were able to, in the end, share those out with their peers as well as share them out with the therapist. So I would say to sum it up, um, we were focusing on client-centered collaboration, engagement of families, the use of modeling and deliberate use of group functions, because that has to be very deliberate and explicit when we're using groups, followed up also by fostering that client self-assessment and follow-through. So that's really evidence of empowering the client to, to continue to make change and giving them the tools to succeed in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much for um, really painting a picture of, of that case vignette. And uh, Susan, could you tell us about the elementary school students case vignette related to working with teachers um, to improve handwriting? Yes, absolutely. So we developed this um, vignette or scenario because handwriting is still a really common reason for referral in the schools. And even though we can and should address all areas of performance and participation, we still play a really important role um, addressing handwriting and are really skilled at um examining the interplay between those person, environment, and occupation factors, and really why a child might be having difficulty with, with a task like handwriting. Um, and so this scenario is really based on um, an age-old dilemma uh, related to should we address handwriting by working on components of performance or performance skills or use more of a whole task approach. And so in the scene, um, a second grade teacher asks an OT for guidance on how to increase her student's eligibility with handwriting and wants support for using visual motor activities and visual perceptual activities. So things like puzzles, marble games, painting. And in the scenario, the occupational therapist reviews the evidence and makes some recommendations um, of ways to incorporate and, and think about using handwriting throughout the day to provide some of that whole task practice and to really incorporate it into typical routines and even to, to develop new routines that will allow for the opportunity to practice handwriting. So things like um, 
writing down lunch orders, notes to teachers and other students, um, using a standard heading on all like loose leaf paper assignments that would be turned in. The OT also models ways that the teacher can provide feedback on the student's performance with handwriting and also results. And another important thing that the, the OT does is works with the teacher to help the students to develop a system for self-evaluation um, of their own handwriting using a checklist and then also to provide feedback, feedback to peers on their handwriting legibility. Um, so really helping with those sort of self-regulated learning skills um, so that they're able to identify when something maybe isn't as legible as it could be and then how to change it. Um, so they're looking at their work and again, the work of their classmates as a comparison. Uh, the OT also meets with the teacher on a regular basis to provide additional co consultation and support. And so rather than, uh, again, taking the student outside of the classroom, really thinking about an integrated approach and, and supporting the teacher to maybe change some of her or his performance patterns to be able to support the students in their classroom. Awesome. These are such great examples of, of high quality OT practice. And I really just have to ask a, a personal curiosity question. And, and that's if these cases, was it something that, that you took from your experience as a practitioner or were they kind of created specifically to provide education and good example on, on how to incorporate these topics into treatment? I could say for the handwriting case, I mean, definitely, uh, I've encountered this many times in my practice. I think that um, teachers sometimes need to understand, you know, how occupational therapy practitioners uh, can work with them and really become integrated into their classroom and, and really are looking for ways uh, sometimes for the OT or OTA to like fix problems, right? Versus um, supporting um, and using strategies that help the children to, de to develop skills that are maybe more complex related to, as we said, sort of that self-evaluation of their work. But what we're finding, what the evidence shows is that those self-evaluation practices are really beneficial and, and can stay with the student for longer, the child for longer. And that's why we know that the co-op model, for example, is so effective because we're teaching that global strategy that can be applied to almost anything versus just focusing on sort of that discrete task or performance skill. Absolutely. And that, Stephanie, was there anything you wanted to add there? Oh, I was just going to say that in regard to the adolescent case, um, certainly uh, one of the goals in that case was to talk specifically about sleep and, and rest, because that is an area that seems to be lacking in the literature and, and lacking in our focus as occupational therapists. So it was important to, to our team to bring that forward and really talk about that. Um, but also from my personal experience in working with adolescents and understanding that they really need to feel part of the intervention team and that in using some of the practices that were outlined in this particular case study, we were able to really illustrate that and that the power that that gives them over time and giving them tools to succeed in the future as they become young adults is so important. So as, as Susan mentioned, that idea of self-assessment and follow through um, was something that we, we really wanted to highlight here. Awesome. Thank you both so much. And it, it really touches on uh, an aspect of these practice guidelines that I really appreciate and love in that, yeah, there's a lot of background research that went into it and there's a lot of evidence backing it up, but you also present this information in a way that's relatable and applicable to practitioners. Um, and I think that really makes a big difference in, in incorporating evidence into practice. Onward we go. Um, so how could you say that practitioners can speak with parents about the use of evidence in practice and explain why they're using certain interventions? This is such an important question, Matt. I think that um, oftentimes parents come to occupational therapy services because they have a really big concern about their children's development or potentially their behavior. Um, sometimes, again, their performance and participation, and they're really looking for answers. Um, and, you know, they have access to Google and all the, the different search strategies that we do too, um, as well as like the media. And sometimes they hear about interventions and strategies um, that seem really attractive, uh, but that maybe don't have evidence or support behind them, or maybe enough evidence or support. Um, 
or maybe just compared to some of the things that we've talked about today, they're just found to be less effective. Um, and so I think it's really important when um, pediatric uh, occupational therapy practitioners um, are speaking with parents that they really provide information about what current best practices are and use them based in the, in the evidence. They're still going to, of course, be using um, their clinical decision-making skills, taking into account um, the, the child and family's wishes, and also thinking about their past experience, but really to stand on the body of evidence. And, and sometimes, you know, that actually means that they do things like de-adapt an intervention or a practice when evidence starts to suggest that it may not be as effective as once we had once thought. Um, and that they incorporate new things when we find that um, there is strong evidence for them. Um, so I think it's it's very important. And I think we're, again, parents are coming in families at a really vulnerable time usually and are wanting to do the very best by their kids. And so it really is on us to help them to sort of get through all of that information um, and really help them to know uh, where they can get sort of the most bang for their buck in terms of resources. Um, and also the time that they spend, right? When a, when a child is in therapy after school or on Saturday or even, you know, during the school day and they're not doing the things that everyone else in the neighborhood is doing or everybody else in the classroom, you know, they're potentially missing out. So we want to make sure that all of that time that's spent is really focused and directed and that it is the thing that we think is going to lead to the best outcomes the most quickly. Absolutely. I, I love that answer. And I, I want to ask you guys what your thoughts are on uh, sharing evidence with parents or, or if you've ever had an experience where you've printed out an, an article or maybe a snippet from a practice guideline and, and shared it with a parent of a, of a child um, and how uh, that kind of affected the relationship or, or collaboration. I, I can say that in my practice, um, especially in the school systems, that we oftentimes had to demonstrate and use evidence um, either with a, a parent or family member or with, um, you know, just in an IEP or a team meeting. And uh, I think that that it's great to be able to show and to point at um, why you're making these decisions and sort of what backs them up. Um, I think it's particularly important when there's some, maybe just some disagreements on the team about what the next course of action could or should be. Um, I think it's also important, again, when team members or parents um, would like to maybe try out an intervention that doesn't have as much evidence behind it or isn't as well supported um, so that you can guide them to making um, a decision or, or accepting maybe a practice that is more evidence-based. Um, and I really think that uh, in terms of my experience anyway, that, that the use of evidence has only strengthened those relationships. I think parents and families are really excited when they know that uh, their OT practitioner has done their homework and, and really does have their child's best interest at hand um, and is really doing everything they can to provide, you know, um, the most high quality service. Awesome. Stephanie, is there anything you'd like to add to that question? Yeah, the only thing I would like to add, and I totally agree with Susan in, in the way in which we can use evidence to help not only build, but support the relationship and help parents to understand that we are um, doing the best we can to service their children and, and that we're using evidence to guide our clinical decision making. The only thing I would add is that I think that every relationship with a parent is a little different. And sometimes it's about the timing and the method in which we provide that information. And so there have been a handful of times when I have actually, you know, brought the actual um, document, a, a a copy of a, a journal article or a couple pages from a, a textbook even that just kind of helps explain what it is that we're trying to help the parents better understand and, and know so that they can contribute to the decision-making process. But that can also be a little overwhelming at times. And so finding ways to make sure that it's really user-friendly or at least taking the time and offering an opportunity to help them interpret. Now, that doesn't mean we, can, we should assume that parents don't understand research literature. I'm not suggesting that. But I think we need to take the time to offer um, ourselves to help them interpret what they're reading, to help them interpret how it applies to their particular child and the situation that we're involved in. Thank you both so much for sharing uh, your perspective and, and some examples of, of that as well. 
the final section of these practice guidelines, we're already moved on to the final section. Wow. Um, is titled Implications for Occupational Therapy Practice, Education, and Research. So what would you say are the main takeaways for practitioners? What kind of skills and actions should they really focus on taking with each of their clients? I can I can start with this one. And as you may know, Matt, there were implications for occupational therapy practice education and research for each of the questions. And so there's a lot of information in the practice guidelines. So I, I'm just going to choose a few that I think are really revel, relevant across all three of those questions. And some of them might seem even a little redundant because we've highlighted a few of these um, pieces earlier. But one of the things I want to emphasize is that practitioners should really focus on caregiver training on behalf of the child. So while we are always um, engaged with the child, him or herself, we know that the parents are, are the expert of that child in the family or the caregiver is the expert of that child. And they're also the long-term resource for that child. And so if we focus on the caregiver training as well, it's going to have a longer-term impact and then, of course, benefit the child in the long run. A second thing I would note is that we want to use peer-mediated interventions, especially in school settings. You know, we can consider our OT knowledge in regard to group dynamics, um, what we know about modeling, and what we know about social learning. And the evidence suggests that when those are carefully designed, those peer-mediated interventions, as I said, especially in school settings, I know Susan mentioned that earlier, are really key. And so we're, we're good as OTs in figuring out where kiddos are in regard to their developmental group level or the skill sets that they have and how to match them up with appropriate peers that can really boost their um, outcomes in the long run. Another thing would be to consider using activity and occupation-based interventions for those who are at risk, especially for mental health concerns. Um, and I, I think this is really timely because we know that COVID has added stressors to children in all settings, and we're starting to see more and more evidence of, of problematic behaviors or anxiety and some of those kinds of concerns that would fall under that mental health umbrella. And so thinking about what puts kiddos at risk and how we can engage them in those particular um, interventions to hopefully ward off some of the problems that may occur down the road or at least to boost their resilience and boost their skill sets. And then finally, it's okay to use manualized programs. So we found that in some of the um, studies, there were manualized programs that really had some strong impact on outcomes. And so as long as we understand the intended population and the scope, and we can tailor them to be appropriate. So it doesn't always have to be a brand new idea. You know, we can look at things like the co-op approach. We can look at some particular yoga interventions, for example, and then utilize those, but make them more client-centered and specific to the particular child with whom we're working. So those are just a few takeaways that I wanted to share. Yeah, thank you so much for highlighting those takeaways. I think they can be extremely valuable for all practitioners working with um, this population. Well, what would you say are some of the main takeaways for OT educators? What topics and opportunities should they really try to focus on, including in their instruction? I can speak to that one a little bit as well. And to, to start out with, I would say it's important for OT programs and educators to really expand their students' opportunities and training and communication and interpersonal skills. What we found in the practice guidelines or what's evident in the practice guidelines is that um, as occupational therapists, we advocate for family-centered services and we have to work with families or teams and also in interdisciplinary service delivery models like schools um, and community programs. So those skills in communication and therapeutic use of self, the way in which we interact and how we build therapeutic relationships is really, really critical. I would say a second takeaway would be to expand instruction focused on mental health and wellness across the lifespan and really considering the unique needs of children. I know that in, in programs we certainly do as educators focus on mental health, but children's mental health is, is its own entity. And so we really do need to look at how they're taking in um, 
the cues from their environment and what kinds of stressors and what kind of supports are unique to that population. And then finally, I believe, and the practice guidelines lead us to this conclusion, that we need to pay more attention to the occupation of rest and sleep. We are now aware that this is considered a public health concern and that children are also impacted by sleep disturbance and it can influence their overall well-being as well as their impact as well as impact their ability to fully engage in therapy. So as clinicians or as practitioners, we need to understand how sleep is, um, kind of overflows into the rest of the day and into our daily occupations and routines and how Um, good quality sleep can have such a positive impact. And I think if we can do a better job in programs helping our students remember and recognize that as part of the occupational profile, we need to also address rest and sleep. That will go a long way as they begin to work with children and youth out there in the occupational therapy world. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And uh, I'm just down to, to the final two questions for you both. Starting off, what additional resources would you recommend to listeners who would like to learn more about intervention for children and youth ages 5 to 21? So we'd like to just remind people that the systematic reviews related to this practice guideline are also published in AJAT. So definitely to check those out um, to, again, refer to the practice guideline of 5 to 21 um, in AJAT. And then also to walk on over to the, um, the AOTA EBP page on the AOTA website and take a look at the critically appraised topic papers. And so these critically appraised topics or CATS are um, basically like a summary of the um, findings from each systematic review question based on the theme. So focusing on either a specific outcome or a specific intervention type, and that those can be a really great resource. In some cases, they provide a little bit more detail Um, than the systematic reviews. So it's another really great resource for people to look at. Awesome. Thank you so much. Any other resources you would say, Stephanie? Oh my goodness. There are so many things out there and I think it, it somewhat depends on um, your practice setting. Now, and again, we can cross over and, and look at different practice settings to garner more information, but there is also, you know, every state has some additional resources, for example, for school-based practice. Um, we know that the CDC and the NIH has some nice information on, on trauma and ways in which we can work with kids a little bit more globally. So that would just be another source of information. Not as OT-specific, but certainly contributes to our understanding of children and youth and how they um, engage in their, their world. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for your time. Um, and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. Um, I just have one more question, which is the golden nugget segment. And that's why I ask each of you, if you could give one piece of advice or guideline um, or recommendation to occupational therapy practitioners who work with this age group, what would you say? Oh, wow. There's pressure. The golden nugget. Um, I guess I would advise everybody, all pediatric or all OTs who work with children, to remind yourselves of what makes OT unique and how we can maximize our effectiveness. Really, um, I think a lot of it has to do with our ability to conduct a strong child-focused activity analysis. And in doing so, we, that helps us understand how they engage in their valued occupations. It allows us to identify and think about the strengths and the challenges and the circumstances that each child brings to the table. And this is so important when we make decisions about occupation-based interventions. We need to have that data first. So we need to meet children where they are in regard to, you know, their development, their interests, their skills. And so I would just say that remember our experience and our skills coupled with the evidence from places like the practice guidelines along with the child's personal context, are, are really what we should be using to influence all of our professional decision-making. Absolutely. I love that. And Susan, what would you say is your, your golden nugget to leave with our listeners? It is a lot of pressure. I agree. Um, but one golden nugget I would say would be um, to start with a top-down approach. So assess and intervene at the occupation level um, and to really you know, be aware that 
when we do that, you know, that's how people will begin to associate us with those really important outcomes for children um, at the level of performance and participation. Um, and so we really should be intervening and assessing at that area. Um, and I agree with everything that Stephanie said too. So maybe that's like more than one golden nugget. <laughs> <laughs> we got bonus golden nuggets today. What a treat. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you both so much again for your time. It was truly a pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Thanks for listening to Everyday Evidence. Tune in next time for more evidence-based practice insights and applications.